Welcome to Inside the Set with Set Decor. Inside the Set is a series that focuses on the design and decor of stories that excite us and ignite our imaginations, where we get to discuss the collaborations between production designers and set decorators and hear firsthand accounts of how those works of art came to be, from their inception to ideas on the page through completion, where we sit in the dark and experience them collectively. Welcome to Inside the Set with Set Decor. I'm Helena Sivilep, SDSA, and today I have the pleasure to interview set decorator Lee Sandales and production designer Nathan Crawley to discuss their creative collaboration on the super imaginative film Wonka. Welcome to the both of you, and we're so pleased to have you with us today. There are so many fantastic and whimsical elements in your designs, and there's so much I'm excited to discuss with you. So let's start with a basic question on how you came to work on this project and what attracted you to it. What happened? We finished COVID, hadn't we? It was 21. I called David Heyman. I've known him for years. And uh, I know he'd called me during COVID and said, we were thinking of doing Wonka. So I called him back in February and said, you still thinking of doing that? And he was like, yeah. Um, he said, but at the end of our interviewing session, so I, I got to jump on with Paul King we sort of hit it off and um, they hired me. <laughs> it was about it. I mean, I was in the States and um, off I went to uh, to Wonka. Hey, what about you? Nathan and I had worked uh, on The Dark Knight many, many years ago. And I was coming to the end of The Batman, uh, my second Batman film. And uh, out of the blue, um, well, I, I I had heard about Wonka because it was uh, being shot at Leaveston, so I I knew I knew that 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 the film was going to happen, and I had this phone call complete at the blue, and I said, "Oh, it's Nathan actually calling me. What's what, what what's this about?" And he said, "Oh, I've got this film, Wonka. Do you want to come and do it?" And I went, "Oh my God, yeah!" And that was it. I'm sure once you hear Wonka, that would get anybody excited, right? And you answer one of my questions. So you guys had worked together previously. I'm sure that's great to have a little bit of that familiarity in that. And I'm sure designing and decorating these fantastic sets um, must have been joyous and challenging at the same time. I understand that you built about 50 incredible sets across three sound stages, a massive back lot, and an aircraft hangar, correct? That's, that's and cool. um, and then had and then you had a fair amount of locations to shoot. How did you decide what you're going to build and what you're going to do on location? Yeah, well, um, that's that's a great question. I mean, I'm just going to go back because I've been keeping contact with Lee for years because uh, I I always thought oh at some point we should work together and we've met socially in London and um, I don't know if you Lee remembered those evenings, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I kind of do some of them, some of them. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, it's great. It's brilliant to, uh, you know, because he was, he also works with Jamie Wilkinson, the prop master who had, I hadn't worked with for years either. So it was just, it was incredible to get everyone back together. And we also had Paul Hayes who hadn't worked for with the his construction coordinator. So it was, it was kind of like the dream team for me, but the design of it was, um, you know, I think, you know, as a designer, you go Wonka, brilliant. You know, Charlie, Roll Dahl, Charlie and the Chat Chocolate Factory. My favorite is Danny, the, the, the champion and James and the Chance. Pete, you, you have uh, growing up in England, you know those stories and uh, you're given them as a kid and you have huge nostalgia for them, like huge nostalgia. And so to be able to do Wonka, a sort of, uh, you know, a new story, a prequel, um, was just brilliant and you sort of because you grow up with them you kind of oddly go in naively and, and optimistically like oh yeah this is of course I know this world and of course that's not the case it's actually very hard to find the fine line of design between uh, you know I call it like Roald Dahl realism you know but what Roald Dahl realism is fantastical joyous happy uh odd the design well in my opinion needs to be a little silent but be perfectly this sort of fine balance of you know the audience sort of sort of falling into the film because it's rolled on and just accepting that that of course that's how it should look and it's it needs to be a, a little sort of silence 
so that's kind of the beginning thought and then how do you get there well that's a whole that's a bigger thing like how do you get that whimsical design it's kind of strange the first thing i work on i think myself and lee i start on big picture like what is the town we the, the story is we arrive he arrives at this town by water so you to me it's like okay i need to figure out what the town is and lee starts at the other end uh and works out like well he's a mad inventor like you know i need to figure out how that all works and we sort of it's a good combination because we sort of meet in the middle. Uh, what was really interesting was you really set out as well a geographical plan of that town of where everything could actually take place. I started putting it into like a real world with the connections from the sea, even the travel all the way into the town, where the town was and the position of, of the church against what the gallery was and, and the town square. And that actually really helped map out in everyone's heads where everything actually were to take place. And basing it in was in like, like a, a real place. It w helped you actually start to work out the definition of the world itself. Yeah, I mean, very much. I mean, I think the sort of town, I, I, I sort of see it as town planning. We don't know what the town is yet, but we need to know that, like, what's the journey? What are all the journeys? Like, we got, we know we arrived by boat. We go up into the town square, we go into the Galleria, we walk down alleys and we go down to, you know, another sort of canal rivery thing. We go to Scrubber and Beaches. So we need to make sure the connections work. And my immediate instinct is always just to go on location because I sort of believe that you just go find it. And then when you can't find it, you build it. You know, you have to control everything, the floors, the dancers, with this big, big machine because we've got these these... We've got all the we've got all the other departments you don't usually get and so we've got to control the music and so really the town square was always going to be built uh, and the joy of going location scouting was you find bits that work and it becomes this sort of jigsaw puzzle i think lee best described it as the best of europe <laughs> <laughs> actually you did travel all the way around like, europe and you went to scotland and to bath to try and find the perfect place and when we couldn't find it that's when you decided to build it right yeah when we decided to build it i mean you know when you're building sets it's huge because you need to build up to 35 feet to to get it in camera and get the lighting right so vfx can take over uh, and they know what it should all look like so you can leave the film knowing that there's enough reference material that vfx can top up and do all their work and you also need to give them proper backgrounds they might decide to take them out in post because they need more depth on that street. So I, I'm sort of a big believer in, we had painted backings. We used, I use devices that I put arches everywhere. So I, uh, when you exit the town square, you frame yourself and then we paint backings. And then the effects frame store could then go in and take, take that backing out if they got too close to it and it fell apart. But it was their choice in post rather than a necessity. We even had a false perspective in, <laughs> in the tunnels. It, it was in the tunnels, yeah. It was, yeah. That, it was brilliant, that was. We even yeah. made the little lights. <laughs> you were talking about creative realism, and it really felt real. In fact, there was one scene I was like, oh, I've been to that cafe in Prague. <laughs> and then I realized that you had built the whole thing. And I thought that was brilliant. Um, and, and I know that you guys melded a lot of different European styles together to create this world. But going back to one thing you said about how your design should be silent, I felt like it was a, um, you really supported the characters, but you didn't overwhelm them. It's, it's the place that the greatest chocolate makers live in. So you come into a town square, someone asked me, he said, why aren't, why weren't the chocolatiers in the town square? It's like, because you... You have to, it's a class system of chocolatiering or confectionery. You've got to start in the town square and then the real guys are in the galleries and uh, what Lee did down in those shops, it just felt gorgeous. You come into the town square, which kind of feels European and cafes and it's mixed with Monte Carlo, Prague, Oxford, London, everywhere, even Berlin. When we were looking at those chocolate shops for the chocolate cartel, I couldn't find really good references for what 
a really high end chocolate shop would actually look like, you know, something that was exquisite. So we actually referenced jewelry shops. We looked at Fabergé eggs. We looked at something completely the other end of like the spectrum. And that seemed like a really good fit to tell that that story of these exclusive chocolates that no one can actually get get their hands on. So, you know, when Willie comes along, he's making chocolate for everybody, you know, so it's like chocolate for the masses. That's kind of to be, that's meant to be part of the sentiment of like the story. It's like he's, he's giving chocolate to everybody. How much of that was real? How much was that fake chocolate? <laughs> Well, I was asked that really recently. And did I take anything off like any of the sets? And I said, well, I only took stuff which I could eat. And like we were with, with a, a chocolate maker called Gabriella. We actually met with like a few kind of people and she just seemed like the most perfect fit. And she came with great like processes and ideas. And she came with like a whole book of like thoughts to like the script and every chocolate that's in that film is actually real. The silver linings, I can, I can say this, is the most delicious thing I've ever eaten. It has a, it has a passion fruit center with like a popping candy right at the middle of it. So it's like explodes in like your mouth. So um, yeah, it's, it can really give you that light bulb moment. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just want to say, like, Lee and his shop. So you have Gabriella, uh, you know, with a little sliding window, uh, you know, this big porter cabin who made chocolates. If you're lucky enough, you might get chocolate at the end of the day as a test. <laughs> and then you go to another workshop and you have Lee, like, what I like about Lee's process is he he tries everything out in the warehouse. He does a test dress. He maps it all out and he plays with it in the warehouse and plays and plays and plays and then moves it onto set but, uh, when the construction is ready. So you get to see all these shops prior to having to deal with it last minute um, on the set, which is which is really nice because there's a sort of discussion. And I always say the reason we build everything to is because without building it, it's not like you do an illustration and go, okay, that's pretty good. There's a journey between that illustration and the set that's a sort of sculptural art direction, set des set designer, uh, set decoration journey that you develop and change. And you, without the build, that is that is something different. And uh, you know, you change colors, you change, you take out colors, you, and and that um, I think is just wonderful. So that's all real. That's really built. That's built. You're below the mat line there. That the back, even the back arch is real. That's all in camera there. Apart from through the arch is a digital effect. It was really there. And I think for the actors, um, now I spoke to a lot of them this weekend and they were blown away, not by, because they could walk into this world, then they'd go into the shops and everything Lee did in the shops was all there. He said, we opened the door and it was all, it was all real. <laughs> yeah. It and was they, really, it was really important for Paul as well, you know, to set the, to set a period style as well it was very much embedded in the 1940s you can we can see it from the costumes and each window and i the set dressing in it from the graphics all the way up to the packaging the boxes the items it was all kind of like very high-end 1940s and that, that was a joy to actually find and source build and actually and then and then implement it all you know he does have that that right mood and feeling to just to tell that story that Paul really wanted. And he's, Paul's very particular about detail and whimsicalness. So he to have to actually make it and build it. He was part of that journey that I talked about as well. He could come on and as we made it, he could he could see it. He could go around Lee's workshops and see it. He's very into the detail. And then to build these sets, we could adapt and change to the dance routines. That and, Nathan, that build line wasn't it like right above? It's it's like up above the third window there on the left hand yeah, side, right? It's right, 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 right. the top of the banners basically in those windows. So we went high. I mean, it's a joy. By mistake, we got to build this set onto the back lot, so you could go from the back lot, you could drive up into the back lot, get off your nineteen forties car, and come in into this set because there were no stages available. So we uh, production built this giant tent next to the back lot and we built this set in the tent 
so for me because i constantly fight like can we just make this set part of the back lot for me it was just like they they, they there's no stages so they, they were like please build this on the back lot so <laughs> The scale is really impressive and, and the visual effects are, are seamless, you, you know, and especially building so high. I think that really helps also. One thing about this town square is the use of color. And I noticed that, you know, each chocolatier has its own, his own color palette. And I love the way the color stands out against your set. So let's talk about how you use color in the film. And, you know, I'm sure you worked with costumes pretty closely. Um, what was your process on coming up with colorways? Well, it was actually the first, one of the first things which, which we tried to do actually was working with Lindy Hemming. And it was the three colors of the chocolatiers. You know, that was really the first three colors, right? Right, Nathan? Yeah, I mean, I think Lee and his team were, you were very much, uh, we had, um, remember Lee, we had all those 1930s, 1940s old, we bought from oh, an yes. I forgot oh, about that. Yeah. In Europe and uh, original. So they had material and color references like deep blues and oranges, but it was done, it was printed obviously in an older style and it had some leaf on it. And we had like 40 different old antique wrappers that we just stuck on the wall. I think, Lee, you riffed off that and said, okay, that's uh, yeah. a fickle gruber. That's, you know, so, and then with Lindy, I think you're in Lindy's shop a lot and you yeah. you say, what about this with that? And so I think it sort of developed, I think everything developed from those old wrappers. That palette and even 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 the feeling of what the wrappers were as well, actually, they were absolutely exquisite. And kind of each one had like a little story actually within itself. And I'm a graphic, uh, a, a graphic design team really took each of those kind of elements and then ran with them you know and and we actually developed all the chocolate packaging based on on those things so each, each one as i said became like a fabergé egg yeah it was beautiful i mean i think for me the color of the set because the colors they were like yeah exactly jewel boxes of chocolates i think the color of the set for me was more about we went to lime regis was you know which is a much uh, you know, to the cob for the entrance where he arrives. Uh, this beautiful, it's in the south of England. It's this beautiful cob, French lieutenant's woman shot there back in the 70s. So I always remember this crazy cob and it's gray. So then, the, you know, one direction, uh, you know, it was heavy granite stone to protect it for the sea wall. So the one direction we sort of had introduced a more a granite thing, stone look. And then the other side was Bath. We went down to Bath. On the, the journey to scrubbers and ble bleachers is through Bath. So that's the warm Bath stone. And so we brought that into the square, uh, and which actually was a sort of bre a great sort of inspiration for me because it's like, oh, we've got to warm this up. Um, and well, and, that, and that's what Bath wasn't Bath like the last element to actually go in as well, Nathan. That was that yeah. was the last part of the puzzle, wasn't it? It really was. But the warmth of that stone and the texture. Uh, and the way Barstone ages is like, oh yeah, this is sort of this becomes whimsical, and it, and and you can do it. And then above the colonnades, we used a bit of Eastern Europe. I can't remember. It was probably a mixture of Prague and Budapest, and you know, we, and then we painted on the details around the windows. So, but uh, we also as well, we also pushed all the colors back, so ooh. they became. I rather it, we didn't want the colors to really pop too much because we were saving that moment for the chocolate shop it became a real conscious thing just to be careful that the colors didn't come too primary you know um we really wanted to save that um I, I think it's as you said it's like you you need a bit of plainness out on the street so you you can singularly view these beautiful windows um and again, you know, I'm going to harp back to this. And that process comes from the art direction of it. It's like you have to develop it in the space. Um, and it's also one of the funnest things, if you have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> actually, strangely, it was actually the town square was actually one of the first sets which we started with. It was up front in like the shoot and it was the one that we had to race to get ready. That's right. I mean, I mean, that shot there. So you see through the arch there, 
So we, we built that arch. So the background through the arch is CG extension, but we had a painted backing. We needed more depth. Again, you use the arches to push the CG away. And so you focus on the foreground and you get this sort of natural believability that uh, I think is key. Because if you get thrown out, if the audience gets thrown out, I think that's, um, you know, you sort of fail, you know? You know, there's um, your your sets, there's so much thoughtfulness and intention in the design. I mean, it's, it's brilliant what you guys came up with. So I'm wondering, um, and you talked about kind of letting things evolve in the process in the and and it's true, things have to kind of shift and change. What was your prep time like um, on this? How much time did you have to play with, say, the town square? I think we had 10 years, right, Lee? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I think it was about, was it was it 20 or 22 weeks? It wasn't masses for the scale of like the so film. The, um, the, not for both interior and exterior, because this is the heart of the film. The problem is you got to get, uh, Lee has to get his crews up and running uh, with design elements because they're all made. Every, Lee made everything. So mm -hmm. I don't think he didn't touch anything. Um, mm -hmm. And then the construction, you, know, you get this pressure from the sort of logistical elements on myself and Lee that come at us like, oh, we've got to get going. So mm -hmm. there's always a point where it's like, okay, let's just start on this. We're pretty happy with this. And uh, so it's it's a... It, it, it's always the time is always against you there's no you never have enough time I don't think I've never ever have you ever leave never never and of course you know we had to um we went sourcing everywhere we went all over Europe I worked with Kate Werner who is um my uh, buyer and uh we went to Holland we went to Belgium we went to Paris um you know we used all the rental companies london we went to northern england to every to all the antique markets just to build up a portfolio for every single set because we knew we couldn't just hire it all and we, and we knew we couldn't make it all so we tried to actually we started off by trying to source but of course you have to give the sourcing like um like a time frame and once you're out of time then you're into like okay then therefore we have to build it you know so it's kind of like you know that's my kind of process and it's kind of like so we had to we had to scramble really quickly you know I think it was the laundry probably took the longest um alongside the chocolate shop to try and find everything for it but but they were but, but all those sets were just really good fun to work on you know the, oh, here we go yeah the Wonka washer love this <laughs> so this is one of my favorite sets and I was going to segue into this so Let's talk about this. Like, how did you come up with this um, laundry creation? Well, do you know what? Paul uh, was obsessed with um, uh, an early uh, English inventor called Heath Robinson. And we looked at uh, some of the things which, which he had done. And it was quite an inspiration, you know? And... Um, one of the first things which, which I did in the film, when I met Paul, I found, um, I think it was a photograph of a dog on, on like a treadmill, something from the 1930s. And I just thought it was the funniest thing which I've, which I've ever seen. Anyway, that actually inspired the whole make of this. And we worked with a concept person called Mark uh, Button, who is really clever. And then we worked out a method uh, how you could mechanize each element of what Mark had actually come up with. And then step by step, I, I went out with Kay and we found each of the pieces and then brought them into our um, our workshops where our prop makers then worked on them. And that whole thing, which you can see there, that's all done in camera. The dog is not actually present. That's been put in and post. Oh. Um, and and I think the mechanism is slightly speeded up, but it's entirely all in camera. When when Nathan had um, mapped out what the architecture was actually going to be, I kind of started with the lyrics of like the song and then tried to map out how to choreograph each element of where it could be in the set in time and rhythm to like the music. So the song and the process of the song all made sense with what the set dressing actually was. 
And through that, we worked out where everything should actually be in the laundry, given any more moment. Did you have to think about choreography in, in most of the sets? Yeah, and, and the team led by Chris was absolutely fantastic. They were so great. We had stand-ins and kind of dancers, and a lot of the dressers which we had, we had doubles of things, so we could put it into the rehearsal spaces. And then we'd get feedback from them. So we knew what we were doing all up front. And then when the actual dress came, they could just sweep in and have like a like a couple of days ahead of the unit. And then we'd come up with just like a bunch of wonderful stuff. There's also the other sort of thing we had to be sort of seamless about is at all these levels, you go from the shop to the courtyard, down to the, the laundry itself. And it was a prison. So then you come back up and uh, uh, Tom Davis would, uh, or Bleacher would, roll call so you have to have that journey up two stairs one down one up and then you go up to the living quarters so you there was a very much the here's this was an important sort of connective piece so uh you understand that you go through the shop down then onto the laundry set and it's uh, it's on you know it's it's deep it's in the catacombs so uh and then back up um at the top and floor. actually Nathan this set was actually built all on one stage wasn't it so we had I think when you walked in on the stage you had the basement which was then actually connected by a bridge to uh, the ground floor which was the shop that was then connected by like another bridge to the interior of the bedrooms that was connected by another bridge that was the exterior of of the bedrooms and so the crew could walk from set to set to set and feel as though it was a composite set it was brilliantly done you have to, yeah, I mean, because then we took the, the outside bridge, the journey from Bleacher, we had it on the back lot to get them off the set. Then we go, well, we go off the set, bath, onto the a back alley, across a bridge on the back lot. Then we took the bridge onto the stage and we land it at the front door of the shop. So you, you, you have to, like, you need to connect those journeys uh, to sort of expand uh, the world, really. You, you, you can't just cut, if you just cut, straight into the shop i think you you're you you don't give any breathing space for the audience to understand the town it totally makes sense and visually you guys pulled it off so well <laughs> it was really brilliant um so can we move on to another one of my favorite sets which is of course is wonka's chocolate shop um let's talk about that how'd you guys start up with that that was the hardest nut to crack, I would say, ah. of, of the whole film. The nuts. But actually, Nathan, the whole concept of the chocolate shop, I it know. is a memory of his mother and his childhood and what he actually remembers about, about his world then. And then he's translated it into the world now as a, as a memory of love. That's, that's the sentiment of it. Right, Nathan? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Paul described it to us. I think he described it as a was it an enchanted garden? We shot all his child. We sh shot a lot more of his childhood, uh, of his childhood that's actually in the film. It comes in, in through it as flashbacks, but we shot it all as one with the riverboat. He he lives in a on a riverboat, uh, you know, somewhere in Europe, where uh, with a willow tree that drapes over. So his memory is this sort of garden moored up to this willow tree and this sort of great beauty. Again, I, for me, it always went back to the, the nostalgia of your childhood and reading the books. You need to somehow capture that in the set. So, but it was quite le clearly laid out because we know I had a weeping willow tree that doesn't really translate. So we made it cherry tree. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> no, but the whole well, the whole set feels like a it felt like a landscape, but it did feel like a garden. The boat, the river, the trunk of the tree, the the bridge made of Turkish delight, the edible flowers, the the little sweetie mine, the candies, you know, the chocolate bees, the sugar beehives, and then all played out like this in like a a piece of theatre. We can't step on the chocolate river because that is comes in the 71 film or at the end of our film so we we knew we couldn't do a chocolate river because when we can't go there yet so the chocolate tree seemed like the way to go i love things that move um so it was like well, let's rotate the tree so when we do this number it starts rotating and it goes up it and it's in an arga shape because it's moving against the, the camera movement 
And then, of course, we decided to spin the tree. So we thought, well, we better spin the river as well. So <laughs> be silly not to, right? I, mean, I feel bad for construction and the sculpting shop because it was like, I need some squidgy Turkish delight as pavers. It really did smell like sugar. You could smell the sugar everywhere. It was actually quite amazing. Those cotton candy clouds, they were made just literally from cotton wool on like a wire frame with that had like a, a steel in them. So it could actually support his his weight. And every flower and the turtle stools, they, yeah. they they were all made, you know, they were um we either bought like bought bought some in a shop and then they were um glazed and then reglazed and glazed again and then sugar was added and coatings of salt just to give all those textures the idea was is that if you looked at it and you felt like you couldn't eat it it was wrong if you looked at it and you could you felt like you could eat it then it was right I also would love the clouds because yeah. they they sort of remind you of james and the giant peach and the cloudman you know so you can there's so much you can draw on. And I think the trick is, is to let yourself fall into it. Although we're governed by period, you you kind of have to let go and just uh, find a path through it. How tall was the tree? 600 feet. No, I'm joking. <laughs> 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 Seems like that, it. That it was. Crazy. It was. It was built. It was built to the height of the Reds. I mean. Yeah. I mean. I, I don't know how, how high that was actually, Nathan. To make the road work, we were like on a platform at eight foot, and then the river was at two, and then the tree went up, and we we pretty much hit. I think it was a forty-five foot high stage. So I'd say about thirty-five feet to the top of the tree. I mean, we haven't even talked about the architecture of the shop. It was really, the architecture was really easy because it sort of belonged in the Galleria and it was, a, you know, the Galleria has a glass roof. So it was easy to imagine that there was a giant skylight up there. And so really that was the the simple bit, you know, getting those curved roofs into the sort of skylight area that lights the tree. I think that was key. I think the lighting took a really long time on that tree. I think, I think it took about five days of prep you know, for the electrical crew to, just to get that completely right. Um, we kept on looking at it again and again and again just to get that one shot. Um, but it did eventually work. Well, I was going to I was going to say you must have worked closely with lighting and the director of photography just to choreograph all of this. And you can see it in the way it's shot. It's brilliant. Yeah. The process is you sort of have a design, you make a model, you sit around it as as HODs as a team with lighting, with choreographer, you know, we, we all sit together and discuss it. And then we, okay, so you kind of know that you're going to have to find it out here, but it's kind of, you have the bones, you start. And then again, you want to keep bringing crew in here as you build it. So at plywood stage is like, and that can be also dangerous because people, you have to take the imagination to step into finishes from plywood. Uh, but at the same time, it's like, you've got to fill the space. And because this kind of set, if you can't shoot it, because it's so busy, it, it's kind of fails as well. This top bit is actually a separate set. And also the technical dress of this set was so hard, actually, I think, because, you know, you know, when we um, with like with the garden of of all the flowers, we had these banks that were uh, like giant slices of chocolate, which the flowers were then actually planted into. And we had the chocolate shop as as a dress first. It was just like as it is now. And then we then had to have it empty. And then eventually it had to be reinstalled again, melted. Yeah. And so we had to make the installation. I think we had three days turnaround on, on each of them. And so um, uh, we had to, um, was the, you know, the, each piece had to be, uh, was actually wheeled in and wheeled out. So it had to be rapid and, and yet yeah, look as though they'd been there for a very long time. <laughs> it was very difficult for Lee and the flowers because everything went on wheels and then we had to chop it up because we realized like, how do we get it? You know, we don't get it in. Get it, get it out of the stage because there's no room, and then under <laughs> under cover. So there, it was all based on door sizes of all things, you know. <laughs> so, and um, you know, so it was sort of logistically very complicated. And then they would require different things moving each day for camera. So it was it, it was a, a real sort of jigsaw of a set that had to come apart, and walls had whole size of walls had to go up. 
and out. And we had nowhere to go with them because of the soundstage size. So we had to fly them. So we'd roll them out and fly them up. And, uh, uh, you know, and then even those windows that are, have all the mechanisms to rotate them. So they're set in pretty solid. So then occasionally we'd have to move one of those out. And so you have all these overnight crews doing stuff all the time. So yeah, uh, what could possibly go wrong, right? Yeah, what could possibly? <laughs> I mean, it's so simple. I can't tell you. <laughs> I, I just have to ask. I mean, did you guys sleep at all during this process? <laughs> I tell you what, honestly, it was it was great fun. And Nathan's amazing to work with. Honestly, he, he makes everything brilliant, and we we really had a really good time making this film. And I think. Like, you know, the whole film is about like, it, 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 it's kind of like a tonic and it's the perfect Christmas movie, you know, it's kind of, um and, and hopefully like what we all did uh, is actually part of that, you know? I love this film. I, I saw it again on Sunday and it was just, it's just great fun. And uh, I'm really proud of it. It's like to do something a little different, it's kind of, uh, in answer to your no sleep question, I actually slept pretty well because it was just such an enjoyable yeah. job. I mean, of course, there's stresses and um, yeah. all kinds. Oh, but... the trap. Now, the trap. We actually actually set that up. I mean, they were all bought pieces from like an antiques market that that took months to find. And then Jamie Wilkinson and his team built all of that um, by hand. And the chocolate box itself is like a world on its own. And that was a real thing. That was all in camera. And um, and it actually worked. And you could get a chocolate out of it as well. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a question about that trap, chicken or egg. Did you come up with the elements first or was it designed and you had to find the elements? I No, do, do you know what? we found the elements first and then just built it from what we found and we tried it it was like um it was a sculpt and some things worked and others didn't and then you tried it again and like you tried it again but the actual trumpet thing which actually catches the little orange man um that was the first thing which we actually did and then from that nearly everything else actually followed uh, Lee process is is brilliant because he He'd come in in the morning or in the evening and said, I'm going to the north of England to a market. Uh, and so you won't see me tomorrow. He's like, what? But we've got to open a set. <laughs> he goes, I've got, to go. I've got to go and get the stuff. And he'd go off and you go like at some crazy early hour with a yeah. bunch of cash in your pocket and a truck following you and you just start buying stuff. And you come yeah. back to the warehouse and then you look at it and go, okay, that's that could work for that, that could work for that. And it was just sort of this very organic get to the markets uh, yeah. and you know, and the markets can't have been easy. It's horrible, miserable, raining, and you'd be out there at all hours trying to trying to find everything and trying to. I mean, I can't. For you, Lee, I must. You must have to just let your mind sink into like, okay, I think, and that might work. I'm just going to buy it. You know. Yeah, I think the start of every film, you're trying to find what that process is, and you know, it's like a sketch pad, and you know, you know some things may work and others don't but eventually you get the language right you know i would say like you start off as like a baby and, and by the end you're completely fluent you know like you know I, I i knew how to speak wonka at the end of wonka and you know and, and you begin and, and your confidence builds and you know each portfolio for each set as you uh, as you get all the furniture and on all the smalls and and it starts to actually come actually together and then you place it actually within the set and and you realize that the context of what you've done is, is actually working you know i think one of the nicest sets actually for me was actually the barge it was yeah. actually the smallest set of the movie and it was it was it was just it was exquisite you know it was just like a warm hug of a set really and also willie's bedroom you know where there was almost nothing in it and i think nathan was like going there's nothing in it, but everything which went in it really had to be absolutely right. You know, there was no way of hiding it through like layers. It was like a bed, a bedside table, a sink. I remember, I remember you, Lee. You went. I was thinking, I don't know, how do we dress an empty set? <laughs> you know, and I was like, 
They're the hardest ones. They're the hardest yeah, ones. They are. Like, <laughs> they can't do anything in it. And, uh, and then Lee went off and says, I just have to sit in it. And you were in there for like four hours just on a chair thinking about it. And then I <laughs> came out and said, oh, you were like Wonka. You're like, oh, I think I've got an idea. And then it just come back to more. I come back and says, oh, yeah, this is like you spent even on the on the, on the broken plaster, the way it was set out in the corners and everything. Yeah. And it just, I walked in and it was like, oh, okay, this makes sense. So, but there's nothing in it, but somehow you put something in it. Yeah. <laughs> well, Lee, I'm I'm glad you said that you loved the barge. That was one of your favorite sets because that was one of my favorite sets. And it was just on screen, such a small portion, but warm hug for sure. That was, I love the interior. I thought that looked, um, Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to live there. Um, Nathan, what about you? Did you have a favorite moment or favorite set? I mean, I don't know if I had any. I have I have just sort of crazy joyous moments, like when we first turned the tree, and then it's like, give me that controller. I want to run the tree. <laughs> so it would be there did, at night. This is, this is true. He had the controller, and he speeded it up so quickly. At one point, it was really turning. Like, you could... <laughs> He'd be shaking right there in the reds. <laughs> Everyone was like, I just like, oh, just leave us alone because I want to climb the tree because, you know, Willie has to climb it. And uh, it's, um, I just, I want to spin it and try it. And we have to like, I just, I find those things just outrageously fun. I mean, in terms of sets, probably the cartel's secret layer under the church, mm -hmm. I felt that that was, uh, I think I just like that set. I like them. I like the whole journey to get there. Um, and I like the complexity and making that place feel like this sort of, again, this sort of jewel box in the catacombs of St. Paul's Cathedral. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> I, I feel like there's so much more we can talk about, yeah. like probably hours unpacking each set. And, and I just have to say overall, what an amazing job you guys and and i'm glad that you had a um enjoyable and joyous time on the film that's great because it can be hard but we do want to find those moments of joy right so thank you oh, for yeah. sharing all your stories um was there anything else you guys wanted to add up add before we wrap up um, you look like you're going to say something lee <laughs> just, eat, just eat chocolate just eat lots of chocolate it's christmas <laughs> Well, I have I I did see the movie with my 14-year-old daughter and she just thought it was the bee's knees. So <laughs> thank you for all that. And Lee and Nathan, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pure delight. I loved hearing about all the creative processes and um and everything you went through to make this um and so that we could see this as an audience and just delight in your design. So thank you so much. And um, I hope you guys have great holidays. Yeah, Thanks very much. See you now. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Inside the Set with Set Decor. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website, setdecor.com.